broadcast. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anna Zylik. I am with ICF, and we are the vendor working on behalf of the sponsors of Energize Connecticut to bring these passive house and all electric homes trainings to all of you. So thanks for joining us today. We will be recording this training and we will make this available afterwards. These trainings are at no cost, thanks to the sponsors of Energize Connecticut and are part of a partnership with Connecticut Passive House. Um, a reminder that as part of this training and workforce development initiative, we are offering a 75% cost reimbursement for individuals pursuing either FIAS or PHI professional accreditation. So this includes the cost of the training and the exam. And once you become certified, we'll work with you to process the 75% um, cost reimbursement. So if you have any questions on that process, please contact us. Um, with that, I'll pass it over to Keegan, who is also with ICF to talk about the Passive House and All Electric Homes building incentives. Yeah, thanks, Anna. Uh, and hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, excited to have you with us today and really excited for today's session. Uh, in addition to the no cost training series that you're here for today, as well as the professional accreditation reimbursements, the sponsors of Energize Connecticut also offer robust incentives for uh, builders and, and developers who choose to go all electric uh, with their residential buildings or to pursue passive house certification in multifamily residential uh, projects with five or more units. Uh, the passive house incentive design, if we want to jump to the next slide, includes both pre-construction and post-construction incentives. The pre-construction incentives include um, uh, incentives for offsetting the cost of things like feasibility studies and energy modeling and uh, pre, um, uh, excuse me, and the post-construction incentives uh, for full passive house certification. The all electric incentive uh, on the next slide is for both single family and multifamily buildings. Uh, it offers two levels of uh, eligibility with specific design and performance requirements associated with each and has incentives ranging from $1,500 per unit in multifamily buildings up to $10,000 for single family homes. Our goal is for everyone involved in the construction of residential buildings in the state of Connecticut to be aware of these incentives. So if you are interested in learning more, uh, please visit our website um, and contact us directly. Uh, as for questions during today's session, uh, please use the chat function on the uh, GoToWebinar control panel, and Anna and I will relay them to Christina and Kate uh, throughout the session. And so with that, I will turn it over to today's uh, presenters, uh, Christina McPike and Kate Doherty. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining today's webinar. Uh, what, what we're going to go through today is a little bit about the, the collaboration between a developer and a certified passive house designer on a project. Um, and we are going to use a case study, which is the Tyler, uh, one of Wynn's projects. Um, but I'll let learning objectives kind of speak for themselves here. Uh, the AIA credits are pending, uh, but hopefully they, sh they should be approved. So hopefully we can get that uh, for all of you all who are joining for that benefit. Um, so we're going to understand how reaching for passive house is beneficial to developers, why it's worth a challenge, identify some of the intricacies of the Enterfit retrofit program versus the new construction passive house and what that looks like. We'll understand how Passive House accommodates historic projects through possible exemptions or special considerations. And we will learn how the developer can work in synergy with their CPHD to simplify the certification process from start to finish. Great. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, as, as, uh, as Kate and others mentioned, I'm, I'm Christina McPike, Director of Sustainability at Wayne. Uh, just really briefly, um, I'd be, I'd be in trouble if I didn't give a quick blurb or shout out to who Wynn is. Um, we're a 52-year-old family founded and operated real estate developer, um, owner and property manager we're based in Boston. Um, and we have a, a pretty large portfolio of, of existing multifamily housing in Connecticut. 
been really proud of um, some of the historic adaptive reuse projects that we've done there, the case study being being one of those examples um, with another mill underway currently in New Britain, um, which is another great example of the work that we're able to do with the state. Um, We've had oh, we've had a commitment to sustainability as part of our guiding principles. Uh, I'd say before sustainability was cool. Um, through an in-house team of, of four folks that are just focused on on driving energy and carbon reduction savings in our entire development pipeline, meaning new construction, historic adaptive reuse, and occupied rehabs, as well as evaluating our existing por portfolio of, of affordable multifamily housing. So that that's it for when. Let's get into the into the content. Sure. So, oops, sorry. Oops, sorry. Yeah, the, um, this this last slide here. Um, some sometimes I'm asked like, why why are you doing this? Um, why does Wind build passive house new construction projects or or uh, Enerfit <laughs> certifiable or Enerfit uh, in, inspired deep energy retrofits like our case study today? And and honestly, there are a lot of different drivers. Um, some uh, some owners, developers, consultants, many people in our industry would answer because that's the right thing to do for for today's uh, generation and, and future generations, um, sort of altruistic approach, um, which is very much core to my own per personal motivations and important to us as a company to win as well. Um, but there's 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 a there's a broad and, and very quickly evolving moving landscape that we're operating in as well as real estate developers and, and property owners. Um, a few maybe somewhat outdated examples here. Um, the energy jobs plan probably could have swapped that out for the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, but regardless, you know, the, the federal government is making some unprecedented investments in sustainability and environmental justice and energy equity, and, and especially in electrification. Um, electrification has, has become a word that I use on a daily basis, and I, I don't think many folks in, in our positions were three, four, five years ago when we were replacing inefficient gas boilers with high efficiency gas boilers. So electrification driven by natural gas moratoriums, um, driven by uh, for more progressive city, potentially county and state level carbon mandates, such as New York City's Local 197 and Berto in Boston. And we're seeing building performance standards like that, basically mandating carbon emissions reductions over time. So because we know we we know that some of the, the, the regions and areas where we're operating buildings, we, we need to make sure that the buildings that we're designing and construction, constructing or the buildings that we're rehabbing today, or in the case of our case study a, a couple of years ago, um, are being built for the future. Um, so we're not just looking at today's code, what's the legally worst building <laughs> that we're allowed to, to build. We're, we're really, um, as long-term owners, thinking, well, I don't, as soon as I deliver my my building, it's going to become an existing building. And, and so I need to think about the carbon performance of that existing building in the context of electrification goals uh, and, and building performance standards. Um, which is related to the zoning and code, um, but in, in some cases, building performance standards are kind of becoming code. Massachusetts, um, as many of you may know, is, is recently approved a new stretch code as well as an, an optional sort of opt-in stretch code for a handful of municipalities. It's effectively mandating or offering pass to pass as a, as a code compliance path for new construction multifamily housing in, in Massachusetts. Um, and then lastly, and kind of maybe perhaps most relevantly to this project, as a low-income uh, affordable multifamily housing property financed with low-income housing tax credits or LIHTC, that's kind of gray box over here on the right, we are kind of unique compared to you know your typical market rate developers in that we're responding to our own kind of special code, which is uh, described in the state's qualified allocation plans. And every state uh, has a qualified allocation plan and you know, 10 years ago, some of them might have mentioned LEED, and five years ago, many of them mentioned enterprise green communities. Now, the vast majority of states across the country are incentivizing, if not requiring, passive house certification. So, um, just kind of keep, keep that in mind, and I think we get into it in later slides, but uh, our case study, you know, I think we applied maybe two times uh, prior for a LIHTC allocation, 
um, and in the process, the QAP had been updated to to offer additional points for projects that were pursuing high performance design standards like passive house. As a historic adaptive reuse project, we're thinking, well, how in the heck are we supposed to comply with that? Um, so Kate's going to talk more about the program here, um, but that was in some cases uh, a sort of primary motivator for uh, for our project decision making here. Yeah, thanks, Christina. That was a great lead in. Um, I have just two slides here just to highlight Connecticut in general um, preservation pathway and new construction pathway for the, the QAP. As Christina mentioned, uh, under the preservation pathway, there is not, Enterfit itself is not called out as a requirement. Um, however, we do like to mention, especially to our clients that are in Connecticut, that Enterfit can be a great pathway to meet those energy conservation goals uh, under the QAP. And then also um, they go hand in hand really well with some of the green building certifications that are some, if not all of the green certifications that are listed there uh, next to the bottom arrow. Um, and just as a, a side by side, I wanted to show just a snip from the new construction portion of that document uh, where it does call out the extra points, one of the certifications being passive house uh, for those four points. Um, so I will introduce myself. I don't know if I ever said my name. That would be helpful. Uh, I'm Kate Doherty, and I work on our passive house team at Stephen Winter Associates. Uh, so that's that's the realm that I, I work in and out of every day. Um, and for this pr project particularly, I, I had joined SWA uh, kind of on the tail end of the project, but got to dive right into some of the analyses that were done um, and some of the on-site testing, which we'll go into a little bit later. But I did just want to talk about Interfit in a more general sense um, as it compares to new construction, because I think a lot of us might have experience in the new construction realm, um, but the Interfit is an option for those retrofit projects. So a few things uh, that differ between the Interfit and the new construction programs under, now this is through uh, Passive House Institute, PHI. There is, for the Interfit projects, for retrofits, there is a component and a performance pathway option. Now for new construction, it's all performance-based. You have your heating demand, cooling demand, your source energy thresholds, um, and you have to, to meet those thresholds in order to pass, as well as the air tightness, um, which stays consistent, but is more relaxed in the Interfit program. Now with the component pathway, which the case study that we are gonna be looking a little bit at today, for 200 Tyler, the, they went with the component pathway. Um, and I did, I snipped here the verification page uh, from our energy model. So it shows, you can see here, it's a little bit more prescriptive as opposed to performance-based. And it has different thresholds that you have to meet for, it's based on the climate and different thresholds you have to meet uh, based on that. So things like the envelope, overall average envelope, um, level of insulation at the different parts of the building and then some window parameters as well. Um, and I, so I mentioned the, the air tightness requirement is relaxed slightly for the retrofit projects under Interfit instead of being 0 0.6 air change per hour at, uh, at 50 Pascals, it is 1.0. And then similarly, there is a relaxed source energy um, along with that component pathway. If you're under the performance pathway, you're gonna follow a similar um, or same source energy threshold that you would for new construction. Um, and in this case, we find that historic projects tend to go with that component path. A lot of times there's things like the insulation, like the exterior that can't change or there's limitations. And we're gonna go into some of that as well for the, the Tyler project. Uh, so I just wanted to highlight some of the exemption opportunities for Interfit. Um, PHI wants, wants projects that are retrofits to be treated as capably as the, the new construction project. So for, you know, don't get into the mindset where, oh, you know, I'm working with, with SHPO or I'm working with my local building preservation authority and they're, you know, I can't change this, that, and the third. No way we can go for passive house. Um, not necessarily the case. For this project, the ones that are starred here were relevant. This is pulled directly from PHI's criteria. Um, but if, if an item is required by the historical building preservation, an exemption can be made for those. Um, if special additional requirements, for example, fire safety exists and there's nothing similar that can replace that product um, in order to comply with Enterfit, that can qualify as well. Or for things like 
the U value of windows um, and the installation conditions that have to do with the existing condition. So among those other things that are there, uh, those are just a few that I wanted to highlight for exemptions. So, so with that in mind, um, or maybe not with that in mind, we, we had this project, right? Um, this is the Tyler Historic uh, School, originally built actually in three phases between 19, or 1936, uh, another wing in, in 64, and a third wing in the 70s. We, we had a plan to convert this vacant building that was owned by the town of East Haven uh, into 70 new apartments. You can go to the next slide, Kate. Um, but we knew we wanted to we wanted to respond to CHFA's uh, high performance design and construction goals, and and had had learned a little bit about Enterfit as a potential option. So we brought the project to Superintendent Associates and basically said, "Can we do this here? Does this work? <laughs> um, have you ever seen a historic adaptive reuse pursue Enterfit certification?" And um, keep in mind, this was this was. Um, maybe four and a half years ago now. Um, so I think at the time it was um, almost unheard of, if not unheard of in, in the United States um, for, for projects to pursue the Interfit standard. But uh, with SWA's optimism and, and support and leadership, we, we were all on board and felt like we had a path forward. Um, so here's an aerial of the, of the building. As I mentioned, there's the three wings we preserve the two wings that are boxed out here in red the 36 wing and the 64 wing these are considered historically significant and therefore qualified for federal historic tax credits um the wing on the, the left side of the of the page here was was demolished and everything behind our building uh which is the historic um sort of auditorium and uh, gymnasium were preserved, and they're actually continued to be or continued to be in use by by East Haven for a variety of, of um, public events. I should say that's true for the gym, but not the auditorium. Um, so we'll flip through some slides just to show um, some photos and, and layout here. Um, it's a typical floor plan. Um, not much to, to glean here, but you can see the, the two wings and, and how we basically reconfigure the interior to accommodate the 70 new apartments. We can do so very efficiently. Um, and you know, we have a, a, a mix of one one beds, a, a couple of two beds, but mostly one beds in studios um, serving an uh, elderly population. Um, so as I mentioned, we we identified a path forward to, to finance and design 70 apartments here. We had to uh, we had to comply with historic preservation, um, and and all design and construction features in the building have to be uh, reviewed and pre-approved and then post-construction uh, approved by the National Park Service and the State Historic Preservation Office. Um, in Connecticut, who's an incredible partner of ours and, and great to work with, we determined yes, we we have a path forward here to interfit certification through the European Passive Institute. Um, we were underwriting um, some energized Connecticut utility incentives, um, and we had uh, plans to help reduce our source energy load in the building by building solar PV on the roof. Um, we talked about this a little bit already. So again, this is the qualified allocation plan at the time. This is the 2017 QAP. It looks very different, as Kate's earlier slides showed. Um, not an inexpensive project to build. Uh, total development cost of $32 million. Again, this was a, I maybe I didn't say this, this was a 9% competitive LIHTC award, which is why I took a couple of rounds to apply for. Um, qualified in addition to LIHTC for the historic tax credit with federal and state. Um, and came in at a total cost of about three hundred thousand dollars per unit, which for a historic adaptive reuse project is is not uh, um, wildly out of the ordinary. Um, so, as you can expect, nineteen thirties building we had, um, and as a school, the glazing ratio is quite high. Um, we had very large windows. Um, they were original in really really bad shape. Um, very sort of thin, narrow sight lines. I mean, the, the frame dimensions um, are very small, and if I didn't mention already steel. In the 1964 wing, on the other hand, we had this kind of custom fabricated aluminum curtain wall system, also in really 
terrible shape after years of the building um, being left vacant. All of the windows in the building uh, needed to be replaced, but they had to be replaced with historically um, accurate re replacements. Um, the building, the building doesn't have a ton of historic features. The, the stairwells are kind of, in my opinion, the most kind of interesting uh, from a design standpoint. Um, I think everybody has different opinions on the aesthetics of the brown wall tiles, but I actually kind of found them to be charming. Uh, and, and the stairwells and the original terracotta flooring, all of that is the historic fabric of the building that needs to be maintained and preserved. So we had designed this building already. Uh, we'd, we'd been we'd been trying to finance it, but we needed to understand what do we need to change in the design? What would the added costs be? And through the PHPP energy modeling process with, with SWA, um, we were able to hone in on a scope of work that added about 6% to the total construction costs. Um, and I've highlighted some of the kind of key scope impacts, um, we'll call them improvements um, that weren't previously on our on our radar or part of our plan. Um, the exterior walls and historic adaptive reuse projects are kind of the most, maybe second to windows, maybe the most sensitive area. Um, we're kind of lucky in this building in that all of the exterior walls, except for in those stairwells, were either CMU block in the 1964 wing or plastered over masonry in the 1936 wing. And, and so unlike a historic mill building with exposed brick and historic fabric, walls, we had plaster, sheetrock, paint, and CMU to work with, which allowed some greater flexibility in what we were able to, what we were able to fur out and insulate. Um, so we we were able to get approval from SHPO and NPS to fur out all of the residential walls in the building to the maximum thickness of, of four inches, which allowed us to, to fit in about three inches of insulation in that new cavity space and beef up the walls a little bit more than we would have otherwise been able to do. Our kind of baseline HVAC system changed pretty dramatically. So we'd started out with the gas boiler plants and the cooling tower up on the on the roof and hybrid water source heat pumps in all the apartments and a kind of normal for wind energy recovery ventilation system that uh, in the interfit design became instead uh, central VRF plants in lieu of the gas boilers and cooling tower. The domestic hot water didn't change. We we kept that on a on a on a condensed boiler plant, so it's still natural gas. Um, and the ERV design didn't change too too much, but we had to select a higher efficiency uh, piece of equipment. So the, the 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 recovery rate of the of the unit itself was increased from sixty five percent to eighty percent. And then we had to extend some ductwork. So originally we were only supplying each apartment at kind of a central location, sort of at the entryway of the apartments. Per the passive house standard, we needed to supply every every room, so living room and bedroom. So it just meant a little bit more soffits and a little bit more horizontal ductwork. work. Um, our windows really couldn't change. We'd we'd already gotten approval uh, and mocked up a window. Um, it was it was kind of a journey to get approval to replace the windows at all instead of, kind of repair them and 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 leave them in place. Um, but but SWA basically found a, a, a moisture concern and kind of cold surface issue at the sill and, and jams and head at the window opening, um, which required kind of a custom detail that Kate will talk about a little bit later. Um, back on insulation, our, our roof insulation was beefed up a little bit from our 30 to our 49. Um, and then our slab, which is really the crawl space underneath the 36 wing, which we weren't originally touching, um, we ended up insulating completely in order to remove it from the air barrier of the building. Um, and then of course, we we added a whole building infiltration requirement on in accordance with Interfit. We were already um, inspecting and testing the building for compartmentalization. So the air infiltration between unit to unit, unit to corridor, unit to exterior, uh, we hadn't planned to do a whole building corridor test. Um, so that was an add as well. So all in maybe, a one one point two million dollar cost, and I'll let you guess what that translates to in today's dollar. Okay, um, and Christina, I couldn't find a photo of it, but um, did the the lockers? That was one of my favorite of the historic keeps that ended up staying in the building. Correct? Yes, definitely. Um, yeah, all the all the hallways obviously have the historic lockers in them. Um, they couldn't be removed. Um, they're not functional. They're all kind of 
sealed shut. But when you walk down the hallway in the Tyler, um, if we have time, maybe I can I can pull a picture up. Um, you like you're walking down the the hallway of a historic school, which is especially nice considering we have uh, two or three residents who went to high school at at this high school when it was <laughs> when it was operational in the I suppose in the fifties. Um, but yes, the locker room is super cool. Yeah, that was one of my favorite um, items when we were there for the blower test. Um, okay, so we're we decided to go interfit on this project. Now what? Uh, so we're going to go into a little bit about the synergy between the developer and the CPHD. Um, and integrative design, we we always like to mention this is so so important, and that's that's the early incorporation of all of the different teams that are going to be collaborating, especially on a passive house project. Um, we emphasize our our collaboration with the architects, the MEP, all of the different subs throughout the process. Um, so getting ourselves, getting the, everyone on board early um, and understanding what it is that they're building and it is a high efficiency building is, is very critical to the process. Um, so I'll just go through this timeline briefly. Um, and Christina, if there's anything you wanna add, please do. Uh, but basically, as I said, we encourage getting your CPHD whoever your passive house consultant is going to be on board as early in the process as possible. Um, and that what that does is allow us to understand the project, especially in this case being historic, what are our limitations, and it helps drive the design recommendations forward from the start, as opposed to we, you know, we've redesigned this building, what do you think? Um, and we, we find out that there's a couple of things that need to, you know, pedal back in order to pass that passive house. Um, those component levels. So through design, um, ongoing on-site testing through construction, and then the closeout, I have question marks there because it depends, depending on the project, how long to get a certification or, or to communicate or to go back and forth with the certifier um, who reviews documentation, et cetera. Uh, so here's just a list. This was every project we, we start out with, what, what are our limitations? And in this case, um, this list here, we couldn't go to triple pane windows. Uh, passive house frames were gonna be difficult, as Christina mentioned, the, the small sight lines on the windows was challenging to achieve at the time for this project. Um, no change to the exterior of the building, where in some cases we might add exterior insulation on a retrofit project, where in this case we couldn't. Um, some of the interior surfaces like those, the, the lockers or certain walls um, couldn't be adjusted in any way and then not to eliminate any doors. Christina, was there anything you wanted to add about that? Oh, we, we get into it a little bit later. Okay. This, this, I should say this list is um, specific to the Tyler, right? So so right. every building is is unique uh, as our reviewers at Chipotle and PS. So, so you might you might find that you can use triple pane windows on on a building. It really depends on the vintage of the building and the existing um, existing design. Great. And then, so this is a little bit just behind the scenes with with myself, someone in my position that's working on a project like this, because um, a lot of times some of this stuff happens in the background while you know design is happening. It's pushing through from from DDs to CDs and what is SWA doing in the background? So from schematics, if we're involved that early, which we hope to be, uh, we might do a preliminary energy model. Uh, and we like to do an existing walkthrough of the building as it is. Uh, and we at SWA, we have a, an enclosures consultant that is on some of our projects with the Passive House team. Um, having an enclosures consultant, whether it's through your architect firm or a third party, um, is really important, especially for these retrofit projects. Um, as Christina mentioned, some of those condensation um, temperature concerns that came up with the windows. A lot of, there was a lot of back and forth with our enclosures team and, and justifying, you know, are we looking at this correctly? Is this actually a concern? Uh, so that can be a really valuable component on your team. Uh, and then, you know, through, through DDs and through CDs, we go through all of the critical thermal bridge models. We build out our energy model, our 3D model of the building, analyze the shading based on that 3D model, um, and we start to collect things as we get closer to CDs, like 
what is the DHW system going to look like? Can we estimate the pipe lengths? Do we have risers and things like that? So that sort of builds through construct or through design rather. Um, and we encourage getting signed on with a certifier in DDs. Now, you might not need to engage your certifier, especially if it's not your first project, but that just gives the CPHD the power to make that first submission to the team, um, to the certifier team, to review our documentation, to review our energy model, um, and start reviewing uh, all of our details as early in design as we can, um, in case there are any updates or, or things that they catch that they would like us to bring to the team. Um, and then all of that gets reiterated in 100% CD around that time, um, where we'll finalize everything in our model, and we want to make sure we have as much buffer and everything understood as we head into construction. So now construction collaboration, um, just briefly, this is as we head into construction from design, I've bolded here. These are the times, at least in SWAS case, where we are on site. Um, so we might do a contractor training or a kickoff at the beginning of construction. We do ongoing site inspections to, to verify things like the, the details that we're recommending or the insulation, make sure it's installed correctly. All of that has to be documented by photo, as many of you may know from working on one of these projects. And then things like interim testing, um, mock-ups we do uh, for this project. I was on site for the, the window mock-ups, at least one of the times that we were on site for that, um, to see kind of the leakage before the building's actually finished. And then the whole building blower door test uh, to get that final leakage. Now, this is the, the punched window detail that Christina alluded to. Now for this project, um, and when I get to the, the photo of what the product actually was used, um, I'll let Christina jump in if there's anything that kind of, how much back and forth was there? Was it a difficult project product to track down? But in general, the windows were embedded very deeply into the, the masonry exterior. And insulating this and tying this into the air barrier for the building um, was a challenge or was was something that needed to be figured out. So ultimately, a custom product was utilized. Um, and this is the product and it was a, a poly iso sort of a board. Um, and this was utilized a finishing board to, to tie that insulation layer all together. Um, Christina, was there a difficult was there a difficult process to track this product down or get it custom made? Was it something you've never seen before? It was not something we've seen before. The window, uh, sorry, the framing subcontractor, uh, along with our general contractor, Keith Construction, helped uh, kind of recommend and come up with this idea. I, again, the issue is we just we didn't have enough room to to insulate and finish. So there was only like a wood sill there. Um, we had to get a a twofer. Um, but not not super difficult, but it uh, it it was not something we'd ever done before. I I just want to acknowledge, and we can talk about this maybe during the Q and A. The last photo showed as this does as well. There's a lot of spray foam in this building. Um, we've got lots of many nooks and crannies. Uh, and the, the batteries and the picture there are not there for size reference, but maybe they function that way. Um, you, but, but you can get a sense of we had a lot of uh, kind of wacky openings to, to deal with when we demolished the steel sash that was embedded in the rough opening. We had concrete and, and, and brick and mortar, um, you know, all over the place. And just just wanted to kind of acknowledge that spray foam has its place. Uh, we're certainly not insulating our walls with spray foam and new construction projects um but we found that to i mean we we basically had to heavily rely on foam based products um at openings like this for both the air barrier and, and thermal um thermal insulation layers yeah and we see that a lot with our especially with our retrofit projects um sometimes there's just there's like you said there's a place for it for spray foam and uh it can lend itself well to to those masonry uh, ins and outs, nooks and crannies. Um, so this is when I was on site for the mock-up test. This is an example of uh, of what we what we did here. We we plastic cover the window system, um, and we we use pressurization to see 
how leaky the window is going to be, um, at least estimated for once the building is complete. Um, and in this case, you see the arrow there, uh, this window was pulling about 12 CFM. Um, so in the grand scheme of things, 12 might not seem like a lot, but added up over the building, um, it's little things like that that can, that can kind of contribute to leakage for the building. Uh, and so just some basic mechanical run through here, um, as Christina mentioned, the building ended up upgrading its cooling uh, and doing a centralized VRF scheme um, with vertical ducted units in the apartments. Registers aimed at the windows, um, and the reason for that was to kind of wash the windows for comfort uh, with the, the conditioned air. And then the wall or ceiling mounted in, uh, in quarters, back of house spaces. So that's the VRF systems in those spaces were, were wall or ceiling mounted. Ventilation, uh, as Christina mentioned, ERV was always the plan, but the, the slightly more efficient unit was chosen for this project to meet that pass pass requirement. And that's a picture of it on the roof there. And then just some miscellaneous mechanical details. Uh, we have the, the central gas DHW remained as planned, uh, dehumidifier in the crawl space, and then stairs heated with the, the wall mounted mini splits. Uh, and I, so I'm including this picture again, uh, just to show you, this is a typical floor, um, particularly the first floor. And when we came in to do the final board or testing, um, the, the one wing, I believe it was windows that were not in and the other, the other wing was correct, all ready to go, ready for occupancy. So we blower door tested that first and we utilized this, this kind of transition corridor as the stopping point. So we, we blow it or tested in, in phase for this project in two different phases. Um, and then all of that came together for the final blow or number that went into the model. He's being polite there. The, the, um, <laughs> the, 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 the reasoning is, is accurate. And this was, uh, this was peak COVID when we were finishing this. So even how one does blower or tests uh, safely was uh, a month long de debate and discussion um, in terms of can can people be masked and working on one floor when you're moving thousands of CFM throughout the building or are we moving COVID from room to room to room? Um, we uh, when, when we had to attempt this in two goes and divide it by wings, which was never part of the plan. And the, that vestibule area had not been designed as a as a continuous air barrier between the two wings, presented many, many challenges. Uh, and and Swan and Keith Construction, and myself, we were uh, we were obsessively trying to <laughs> to, to seal up that vestibule um which was which is a wide open hallway connecting the two all to the, the two wings so um i don't know if we get to the 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 punchline here we didn't end up passing the, the one ach threshold unfortunately um but we we're so proud of the outcome uh especially as our our first floor door test i think one of my what i'm most proud about is that following the tyler we have a dozen projects seeking passive house certification so it didn't scare us or our, our team away um if anything i think it was kind of a kick in the in the rear end and motivation to to, to do better on the next one um so i guess that kind of answers this question of how, how did this inform future projects but more specifically we are doing a historic adaptive reuse project right now in lawrence massachusetts about an hour north of boston um we we received a a, a very impactful award from the state uh, massachusetts department of energy resources to help support that project pursuing an all-electric design following the columbia gas explosion in merrimack valley a couple of years ago um and we we really looked at everything that we did well at the tyler and and for areas that we could improve on and, and really started out it was never a redesign we started out that project as we we want to design this as to be the lowest energy low carbon building that we can even though it was originally constructed in 1846. Um, so some of the improvements made were, um, you know, some of the prior photos that, that Kate showed, we built the Tyler with light gauge metal studs um, and uh, our other mill, mill products in the corner we were using wood studs to help reduce the, the conductivity there on the exterior wall. Um, we were able to mitigate that at Tyler because we, we 
we kept the metal stud off the masonry um, and insulated behind it. Um, this is just sort of an additional measure there. This project um, has triple glazed windows. It'll be our first project with historic ship on NPS approved with triple glazed windows and ho hoping is somewhat of a precedent setter in, in some ways. Um, similar to the Tyler as VRF, um, the difference is that it's a simultaneous heating and cooling VRF system as opposed to a kind of a change over two pipe system as we have with the Tyler, um, which was a direct response to some kind of zoning issues that, that we originally had and was just, was kind of a um, a training need and education on, on our part and, and for our management and maintenance teams. But in addition to VRF on the heating side um, and cooling, we are all electric. So it will be our first um, air to water heat pump for domestic hot water system as well. So again, just the incremental improvements uh, from, from 200 Tyler to current historic adaptive reuse projects that we're doing. Um, I can elaborate a little bit more on the on the zoning issue, but um, you know, when you saw how large the windows are. The shoulder seasons are becoming more and more challenging across our portfolio and properties that that can't easily switch back and forth from heating and cooling, right? So if 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 we're required to provide cooling or, or heating rather from October first to June first, and you have a really warm October, maybe even November, and that building's in heating mode, it, it, the VRF system is a lot easier to switch if you had a two pipe chiller that you've just drained. Um, but there's some nuances there and, and it has real impacts on electricity use and demand and cost, switching back and forth from heating to cooling. So it took us a uh, solid you know, four to six months working closely with Mitsubishi and, and our mechanical engineer, Peterson Engineering, to, to figure that out. And we ended up adding um, some, some um, some glazing kind of retrofits to the south side of the building to help mitigate solar heat gain um, gain there. Um, much of which was based on you know direct tenant feedback, which is really important. Once these you know no, no one knows the buildings better than the people who live there. Um, so we can design it, design a great building, deliver a great building, and then once you have real people and families living there, you you can learn a lot more. Um, and so we were able to make some some adjustments and improvements that informs how we were programming the VRF system, what we were doing with some of the windows that um, that that were uh, in, in need of basically greater shading and, and so forth. And I just want to add, um, I have not ever seen a developer as involved as Christina on site during the blower door test in the <laughs> ceiling cavity trying to figure out what it is we were looking at, where are the leaks happening, what can we do to fix it, and chasing leaks right along with us. So that was proof of you know great project involvement, a great team that actually cares about the project and the outcome. Yeah, thanks, Kate. The only thing I'll add there yeah. is I still have I still have the the shirt that I wore that <laughs> day because it has it has foam uh, crested on the on the sleeve. Uh, it brings back brings back fond memories. <laughs> Um, so to that point, uh, we just wanted to mention kind of that post construction operations and maintenance aspect of it. I think Christina, you mentioned it with the tenant feedback and talking to the people who are actually in and out of the building every day. Uh, and Christina at when you guys have a, a good unique perspective to that because you are maintaining ownership of a lot of the buildings and an operation of a lot of a lot of the buildings, whereas sometimes buildings are like great job. You did passive house, but. Now we're turning it off to, you know, handing it over to the people who are actually going to be operating it. And um, and sometimes there's a gap in that training um, or in that, in that um, what, what is happening in the building that you're, you're working in every day. So from SWA's perspective, we tell clients all the time, we, we care, we wanna know how the, the building is actually performing. Please email us and let us know. The tenants are great. We haven't heard from them at all. You know, other buildings we've worked in, We've had complaints, but we haven't heard from any tenants or the opposite. We want to know, like Christina said, the, the south glazing or people are overheating on one side of the building because they aren't able to switch to cooling. Whatever the case may be, we want to know about it. Um, and, you know, even though, unfortunately, we didn't get all the way to 1.0 with the, the blower door test for this project, 
that Tyler is showing is one of our best performing projects in the portfolio. And that's across the board. Um, and a few things that we think are contributing to this, uh, it is senior housing. So there's, you know, assumed less over overall cooking, less clothes washing. They are low density units. So they're, they're one bedrooms, they're studios, one or two occupants per unit um, and slightly larger units than we're used to seeing on some of maybe our, our city or affordable projects. Um, and I will, I will plug, um, SWA has a recently sort of new uh, resource, SWA Academy, um, and we're hoping to see some more staff and development trainings upcoming for that platform, uh, which could possibly be used to educate project teams, as well as the people building the building um, and possibly the people who will be operating the building. So more to come on that, but if you have any interest in looking into that, swinter.com slash training. Um, and then our emails are here. Thank you so much for joining. Um, I'm sure there's some, some items in the chat, um, but I will just say thank you. Thank you for listening in. Kate, Christina, great job. Thank you so much. Um, there's a couple questions here in the chat. Um, one is asking where specifically you located the uh, outdoor units for the heat pumps. There, so the central VRS system, right, obviously the outdoor units, but just to clarify, they're, um, it's a central system, so you don't have one per apartment. So I think we have maybe nine large outdoor units and they're almost all on the roof. Um, there is a sort of courtyard, rear courtyard area um, where we located uh, some of those units though. So some of the common area um, condensing units are located at grade behind the building, um, but all of the central VRF uh, condensers are up on the roof. And as, as is the ERV system. Great. Um, how, in your experience, and if you have experience working on new construction projects, how did the experience of, of this project compare to ground up new construction in terms of um, some of the principles of, of passive house and adopting the interfit um, model? Um, I could speak to that a little bit. The most, I'd say most of my experience has been in new construction uh, with the exception of a few projects that were um, both retrofit and historic. I think one of the biggest things from SWA's perspective, from the energy modeler's perspective, is that sort of initial identification of what actually is existing. When you're building a new building, you can see the layers as they go up. But for things like the insulation, what, you know, thankfully this building was masonry, um, so it wasn't too hard to, to understand kind of what was happening behind the walls. But in some retrofit projects, one of the most challenging things is is there that insulation back there or was it just designed in the original blueprints that it actually get put in is it has it maintained its effectiveness for however long the building's been in operation um so sort of an exploratory phase i think is the biggest difference that we that we see on our side of the projects the, the only thing i'd add is that as it should be the interfit standard uh for historic projects as Kate described earlier have certain waivers and exclusions so it's um it it, it, it can it it works with the building needs um in some ways that makes it somewhat more lenient um so I, I think uh you know our new construction PHI and FIAS projects for that matter are um re require greater and more, more intense oversight um, and involvement in the fields um, to make sure that everything's going up as it, as it should be and needs to be. And I think we have more opportunity to, to, to perform, you know, some mock-up testing, partial whole building, blower door testing, things, things like that, as you can sequence new construction kind of more easily than the historic retrofit. Great. A um, couple other questions are coming in here. Um, what challenges did you encounter with uh, foundation and slab insulation and, and vapor control down um, below the foundation? I'll let you speak to that, Christina. If you could elaborate on what you were mentioning with the excluding from the barrier slab insulation. Sure, yeah, sure. Um, so, so in the 1936 wing, we have a, a crawl space, maybe five foot, or five foot tall crawl space under the entire building. Um, 
and we dealt with that the best we could with a uh, with a whole bunch of spray foam. Um, so we so we foamed the foundation walls and the underside of the of the ground floor floor or the ceiling of that crawl space, um, and installed dehumidifiers throughout, uh, which has been working well. It's relatively easy to to maintain normal kind of property op operations and maintenance. So that's how we're con controlling for air and vapor in that section. In the 1964 wing, we actually had to raise the floor by about six inches. So we basically built a new slab. So we insulated on top of the existing slab and then poured a new um, lightweight you know, dipcrete floor on top of the new insulation. So the, the steps going down to the, to the partially below grade bottom level of the 1964 wing we basically built a new floor to meet the bottom step um, so that we didn't have to reconfigure the work stairs, which we, we couldn't do if, even if we wanted to. Um, so I think we have four inches of, of uh, rigid insulation, um, a vapor, sorry, a vapor barrier on the existing slab, four inches of rigid insulation, and then maybe an inch and a half or so of, of topping slab on top of that. We didn't is, do any kind of exterior ex excavation, sorry. Um, so like no, that's okay. expose, expose the exterior foundation or slab. And the same is true. Well, maybe we should, we, you want to talk about the floor to wall intersection at each level, not, not the slab level, but the upper floors. Yeah, so, and I was going to say too, you know, it's not always the case where we build up a floor on some of our other retrofit projects we've seen. Um, you know, historic tile conditions or things that couldn't be covered, like Christina mentioned, the stair, the stair format, formatting couldn't be updated in this case. Um, but sometimes the answer is do nothing if there's no condensation risk to match it. Um, because a lot of times excavating the exterior, there, there's no way to insulate underneath an existing slab that's on, on grade. Um, Sometimes there's room for some vertical insulation at the exterior, um, but then yeah, for the for the actual slab edge condition, we had done a model for for this project um, to ensure that the the floor temperature um, would pass sort of PHI's comfort criteria or wouldn't be a concern at that location. Um, and I what was the product that was utilized there, Christina? Forgive me for. Okay. No, it's okay. We 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 basically and I again I I I hate to admit this, but we just we spray foams. So we we carried our our wall insulation up into the ceiling cavity on every level to help mitigate that bridge at the concrete floor slabs to the brick walls. Um, so we used close cell spray foam for yeah, a foot, foot and a half, maybe two feet in uh, for a few inches, and all of that was determined by therm modeling from from swap. Correct. Yeah. Typically we do a 3D, a 3D model um, for those sort of conditions. Uh, and that gives us a gauge of how far into the floor plate does the insulation need to travel in order to mitigate that that temperature that's not maybe not passing the comfort criteria. The comfort criteria to me was kind of the most eye-opening. Like obviously we've talked a lot about durability, moisture management. We don't want to create a new problem while addressing some other problem um mm -hmm. but but i hadn't i hadn't thought about it in terms of comfort um so so no no i'll stop your head what that what that temperature is right but but our residents mm -hmm. should be able to put their hand on on the wall or or walk barefoot <laughs> in the winter in their apartment and the surface temperature never drops below well, I, I think it's know. 48 i think 48 is the and that might vary slightly depending on climate. I'm not 100% sure. Um, but for this particular building, I was looking at the model yesterday and I think it was 48 degrees. Um, and that's at the, you know, that's the minimum temperature at the wall. Like any, you don't want it to be any less than that. And obviously closer to room temperature is ideal um, as you get into the room itself for, for the tenants. But yeah, that is, that is an interesting component of uh, of passive house. We say it's a comfort criteria. It's a comfort standard first and then a performance standard following. A um, couple other questions here. Uh, someone has asked actually if you could flip back to the uh, 
uh, slide that has your uh, both your contact information. I want to reach out Sorry, with some. Yeah. Yep. Um, uh, you mentioned triple glaze windows. Um, why were those not feasible in the project? Um, we didn't have. I mean, a couple of reasons. We we didn't have enough frame width to support the third pane of glass and the weight of that glass. So, so the new frame had to be the exact same dimension. We had a quarter inch to play with, but but every component of that frame has to be within a quarter inch of the original 1930 steel sash and steel frame. So you didn't have a deep enough pocket or wide enough pocket in the frame to accommodate a third pane of glass. As part of the reason, um, cost was another, uh, and third was it was was maybe more timing, which goes back to cost. Um, and that, as I mentioned, we'd already design, taken the project through to a pretty far level of design before pivoting to Interfit and modifying the design. We'd already mocked up a window and received approval on the window, um, and didn't frankly think that we would be able to. Uh, find another window that could get any closer uh, while improving the performance in a meaningful way. I think window products are coming coming a long way too. Every year, uh, we're seeing more and more manufacturers that are making their units more efficient, thinner frames, smaller sight lines, things like that that might be able to accommodate more historic projects as well. Yeah, that agreed. And it's it's really challenging when we're, we're we're required to replace a steel or aluminum window with an aluminum window. Um, so finding a, a high performance thermally broken aluminum window frame um, is tricky. So even if you have a really good glass package, a center of glass of whatever point ten, uh, you value you put all that in a kind of bad aluminum frame, your whole window U-value rating is not so good. And um, you know, and I found on a couple of other sort of examples and analyses that that if you can't fix the frame, <laughs> throwing out a third pane of glass is just it's really not doing you any any good in terms of performance. Great. And and who was the manufacturer on the windows? Um, we worked with Universal for the windows here. Got it. All right, last question, since we're right at uh, one o'clock. Um, did you consider Energy Star uh, certification for the project, or did you achieve Energy Star certification, or if not, did you consider, or what, what reasons, uh, why not? <clears throat> we did not achieve Energy Star certification, although we did we did achieve meet Energy Star compartmentalization requirements for 100% of the building. We worked with a, a different rater for that uh, in order to qualify for the um, commercial residential new construction um, utility incentive program at the time. Um, but we didn't pursue certification. I don't think our windows would have uh, would have satisfied or met the Energy Star um, certified glazing requirement. Um, I'd like to think that if we you know, put it through energy service to community construction, it probably, probably would have. Um, but in, in short, no, but um, we actually, in addition to passing the compartmentalization testing, we completed HERS modeling for every apartment. Um, so while we wouldn't have met certain mostly window related mm -hmm. energy star glazing requirements, we did meet energy star hers uh hers ratings and duct leakage testing room balancing and the compartmentalization uh, infiltration requirement got it great well i think that's just about everything um so i'll take this moment to just remind everyone that um if uh, the aia uh, ceus are pending um but if you are seeking those uh do please respond to the survey that you'll receive uh from us after the today's session uh both the recording and today's presentation will be posted uh to the portal on the connecticut passive house uh site um, if you, uh, Kate, if you want to go to the next slide, just as a reminder of where that, uh, sure. that works for folks, um, 
And yeah, if you have any questions, uh, please reach out to us again. Thanks to the sponsors of Energize Connecticut uh, for putting on today's session. And, and Kate and Christina, thank you so much. We really, really appreciate having you on today and, and talking about this really cool project. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for having us. Great. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.